probably a lot of different reasons why certification is important, but um, one of them is that if we take a look at the human medical field, when medical professionals are required to have CPR training in order to be able to help people um, appropriately, we don't have uh, something like that in the veteran field. That we are working in the veteran practices, um, treating animals, but even licensed veterinarians, um, you know, credentialed veteran technicians, they may not have gone through uh, training for CPR specifically for animals that should hopefully improve the chances of their survival. And so, uh, you know, thinking about that, it's kind of mind-boggling that uh, we don't have a certification process or a requirement in place to save animal lives in that situation. That there is a huge amount of variability in how people do CPR, and that's through no fault of their own. The people who said you should do chest compressions at 60 per minute in dogs, which is about half of what we actually recommend these days, are not wrong. Um, it's what they learned, and it's what what was considered to be the um, standard of care when they went to vet school or when they went to tech school, they learned the correct thing. It's just that then science progressed and we learned actually if you go at twice that rate, you're much more likely to have a patient survive. Um, and so that update of those guidelines is really important and then that certification process with recertification is really important because if you're out there in practice, um, there's no way for you to know that suddenly things have changed and suddenly we know a better way to do something. Compressing a little bit deeper? Yeah, compressing deeper. We would perform CPR in our critical care setting and many times things would not click very well within the team and then walk away. we would walk away being so frustrated about possibly us not doing the best job possible for the patient. So we feel strongly that CPR certification should be expected from any veterinary health professional. And I think this, this sort of also is compounded by the fact that people look at papers about CPR outcomes and they see, oh, six to seven percent survive to discharge. So why should I even bother? You know, maybe it's not even ethical to offer CPR. And uh, it would be completely understandable to come to that conclusion. I think the important thing that people need to recognize is that when you look at those papers, they're looking at animals that have arrested for any reason. So there's a very big difference between the 20-year-old cat with renal failure, heart failure, and abdominal mass, and diabetic ketoacidosis who dies in your hospital, and the two-year-old Labrador who you just anesthetized for a mass removal who arrests under anesthesia. The cat is very unlikely to come back. It's got multiple non-treatable diseases that I can't fix, so that's not one that I'm going to have good success with. But the two-year-old Labrador has a really good shot, and in fact, if you look at the data that we already have, which is from before the guidelines, about 50% of dogs and cats who arrest in that peri-anesthetic period actually survive to discharge if you act quickly and you do CPR well. So those are the cases that we really want people to focus on. Every veterinarian and veterinary technician is going to be involved in anesthetizing and sedating patients, pretty much without, without exception. Um, and if you are anesthetizing or sedating a patient, there is a risk that a cardiopulmonary arrest will occur. Um, and if it does, if you act quickly, there's a very good chance you can save that pet. And so we try to get people to focus on that. It's really important to not get, dis get distraught by those low survival numbers because they're not really accurately reflecting your chances with that subset of patients that you deal with every day. Well, in human medicine, they do have um, more studies for CPR and higher recovery rates for CPR. But they also have standards. And so if we train everyone to do the recover initiative standards that have shown to be effective, then I think that our numbers are going to get higher than what they are now. So I think that's a very exciting part of the recover initiative is to reevaluate that when we get everyone doing CPR the, you know, correctly. We have the knowledge, now we need to distribute it to the rest of the veterinary field so that uh, if this is something that does in indeed improve outcome, which I think you know, any kind of training will improve outcome, then we just need to get it out there. To become a Recover Certified Rescuer, you first have to take an online course uh, from the Recover website and then attend one of the in-person training sessions put on by our certified instructors. Uh, and um, currently those happen at uh, various conferences as well as individual instructors putting on training sessions elsewhere. Uh, and then after you get trained as a rescuer, you can go ahead and uh, sign up to become a certified instructor yourself if you choose to do so. And that happens at major conferences at the moment. And all that information is on our website. 
We really want to get the word out that it's worth being certified, it's worth really making sure that you know how to do this well, because if you do it correctly and you do it quickly, there's a really good chance that you can send a lot of these patients home. Great if no veterinarian ever had to call a client again and say, you know, I was spaying this very healthy pet and unfortunately she passed away under anesthesia. It'd be awesome to never have to make that call again and there's a chance we could really reduce those numbers. Yeah.